Hello friends, this video on respiration in plants part 19 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So with this, I think we have reached towards the question time. So now that we have discussed this lesson on respiration in plants, where we have spoken about the aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, let us quickly look at some of the questions just to evaluate whatever we have studied so far. So question number one, distinguish between respiration and combustion. Okay. So let us distinguish between respiration and combustion. So as you see both processes are similar in the sense that in both the processes oxidation happens to release energy. But if you talk about respiration it is a biological process which is involved with the biological activities taking place inside our body whereas combustion is a chemical process. Respiration is a slow process because you just now saw that right the process of respiration is a multi-step process so so many things take place inside our body after we take in food so it actually takes time it is a slow process whereas combustion is a fast process you just try to burn something, the process will be very rapid. It doesn't take much time. In respiration, energy is stored as ATP in the form of ATP molecules which are utilized by the living organisms as and when needed. But in case of combustion, the energy is lost as heat. So when you burn something, you see fire is there, a lot of heat is produced and that is how the entire energy is lost. Respiration occurs at a normal temperature, but combustion needs a high temperature. That's why for burning, the temperature has to be high, right? So these are some of the differences. Next one, distinguish between glycolysis and Krebs cycle. So when you talk about glycolysis, it is a part of both aerobic and anaerobic respiration, whereas Krebs cycle is only for aerobic respiration. So if you see for anaerobic respiration, the first step is glycolysis because glycolysis does not involve oxygen. But if you talk about the Krebs cycle, before Krebs cycle, oxidation of pyruvate has to take place, right? So that oxidation of pyruvate doesn't happen in case of anaerobic respiration. So this is only a part of aerobic respiration. Glycolysis occurs in cytoplasm, whereas Krebs cycle occurs in mitochondria, very true. Glycolysis is the first step of respiration, so it is followed by Krebs cycle because the Krebs cycle comes later than glycolysis. But when you talk about Krebs cycle, it follows glycolysis, so glycolysis comes before. What happens in glycolysis? Glucose gets converted into pyruvate or pyruvic acid and in Krebs cycle, the pyruvate gets completely oxidized forming a lot of NADH molecules, FADH2 and ATP molecules. In glycolysis, CO2 is not released, but in Krebs cycle, CO2 is released in this step. So I'm sure you would have noticed all these differences while we, we were discussing about the processes of glycolysis and Krebs, Krebs cycle. Question number three, distinguish between aerobic respiration and fermentation. So very easy, I feel. Aerobic respiration, obviously in presence of oxygen, fermentation, absence of oxygen, of course. In aerobic respiration, what is the product that is formed? Product is carbon dioxide, water and energy, lot of energy. So no alcohol or acid is formed. But in fermentation, ethanol or lactic acid is formed. If it is alcohol fermentation, ethanol will be formed. And if it is a lactic acid fermentation, then obviously lactic acid will be formed. The net yield of ATP, there is a huge difference in aerobic respiration, almost 36 to 38 ATP molecules are produced, but in case of fermentation, only two ATP molecules are produced. Let us look at the next question. What is the significance of stepwise release of energy in respiration? Now, I spoke about it before also, right, that the entire process of respiration could have been a one-step process, but in that case, when so much of energy is getting released in one step, there would have been a lot of wastage of energy in the form of heat. But when it is happening stepwise, so each step is under our control. So whatever energy is getting released in each step, that can be further utilized for ATP synthesis. So it can be controlled in a better way because each step is getting controlled by an enzyme. So we can control the activity of the enzyme. So that is, what, that is how the entire process, if it is a multi-step process, it can be controlled in a better way. The energy can be utilized in a better way. 
So energy loss in the form of heat can be prevented, very true. Maximum energy can be utilized for ATP synthesis. Also, many useful intermediates are formed. For example, if you take the example of glycolysis as a process. So glycolysis is just a part of respiration, but it was a 10 step process. So it was not only the final product pyruvic acid which was formed, there were so many intermediate products which were also formed and those intermediate products can actually be useful in any other metabolic processes taking place inside our body. So that means many useful substances are also formed midway. Activities of enzymes in different steps can be controlled, yes of course, because for each and every step a different enzyme is playing its role. So if you want to control a particular step, you can control that particular enzyme. But if it is a one step process, there will be hundreds of enzymes uh, working on that one single step. So you will not know which enzyme to control and which not to, right? So these are some of the reasons because of which uh, the stepwise release of energy in respiration is very, very significant. What are the assumptions made during the calculation of net gain of ATP? Now, once when I finished my discussion on aerobic respiration, I told you that the total number of ATP that is produced is 36 to 38 molecules. So that is a theoretical calculation basically because when we assume, when we actually make that calculation, we assume that every NADH molecule which has been produced will give rise to three ATP molecules. Every FADH2 will give rise to two ATP molecules. So, but actually in reality what happens is some of the NADH molecules might get utilized somewhere else because respiration is not the only process taking place inside the body. There are numerous processes taking place. So maybe one NADH molecules might get utilized somewhere else. So you run short of one NADH molecules. So your count decreases by three. Again, let us suppose uh, when the process of glycolysis is taking place in some step, some molecule is required but that molecule has been utilized in some other process so maybe the glycolysis did not take place in the proper sequence so that will also affect the net gain of ATP molecules so when we consider that calculation we have to make few assumptions like this that the entire process takes place in the exact sequence when I say exact sequence I am talking about the sequence which I discussed when I explained to you the process of aerobic respiration, that is the first step has to be glycolysis and immediately after glycolysis happened, all the products of glycolysis should migrate from cytoplasm to mitochondria without any loss, without any of them getting missed. From in mitochondria, again, the next step that is pyruvate oxidation should take place. Again, none of the products should get missed here and there. And then the third step that is uh, Krebs cycle should occur, it should happen in the exact sequence as is mentioned theoretically and then the electron transport chain. But actually in reality things do not happen in the exact sequence and that is why the net gain of ATP which I say is 36 to 38 molecules is not always the same. Sometimes it is quite lesser than that. None of the intermediate should be used up in synthesis of any other compound, which is so unrealistic because there are so many processes taking place inside our body. We might not know sometimes some of the intermediates may be used up for something else, but we have to assume that none of them are getting used up. NADH synthesized during glycolysis or pyruvate oxidation should enter the Krebs cycle or the electron transport system appropriately. So we do not want any kind of loss of any of the intermediates or any of the energy rich molecules anywhere throughout the entire process of the respiration. Only in that case our calculation of net gain of ATP will remain true. So these are some of the assumptions that we have to make, we have to make when we calculate the net gain of ATP. No other metabolic pathway interferes with this pathway. Of course, that's the same thing what we have discussed. Okay, so let's look at question number six. What is oxidative phosphorylation? Now, as I mentioned, phosphorylation is nothing but it means adding an inorganic phosphate to a compound to form a new compound. So phosphorylation comes into picture whenever we talk about ADP. ADP is a diphosphate molecule. If you add inorganic phosphate to it, it forms ATP. So this process is known as phosphorylation.
Now, when I say oxidative phosphorylation, the term oxidative actually tells me from where is the energy which is required for this reaction to take place because basically a bond is being formed between these two. So, whenever you form a bond, you need to supply some energy. So, from where is that energy getting supplied here? So, that energy is coming from the oxidation reduction reactions and that is why it is called oxidative phosphorylation. So, the process of synthesizing ATP in the electron transfer transport system is known as oxidative phosphorylation. So utilization of energy from oxidation reduction reactions to develop the proton gradient which in turn helps in phosphorylation of ADP to synthesize ATP is called oxidative photophosphorylation I mean oxidative phosphorylation. While we were talking about photosynthesis we talked about photophosphorylation because there also the same process of phosphorylation was happening you remember there also we spoke about the proton gradient developing ATP synthase getting activated and then ATP molecules being formed. There also the process of ATP synthesis was by chemiosmotic hypothesis, the same concept. But the only difference was that there this energy was provided by sunlight and that is why the name was photophosphorylation. Let us look at the last question of this lesson. Discuss. The respiratory pathway is an amphibolic pathway. What is amphibolic pathway? This is a new term. Amphi means both. So amphibolic pathway is a pathway that involves both catabolism and anabolism. Now what is catabolism and anabolism? So when I talk about catabolism, catabolism means a bigger molecule or a more complex molecule breaking down into smaller molecules and releasing a lot of energy. So that is catabolism. When I say anabolism, I mean many small molecules coming together to form a bigger molecule and in order to in order for this to take place it requires energy it doesn't release energy but it requires energy so now if there is a, any such process where both catabolic as well as anabolic reactions are taking place that is known as an amphibolic pathway now if you look at the process of respiration the respiratory pathway for example let me consider the process of glycolysis what happens in glycolysis in some of the steps if you see energy is utilized so here atp is taken in so atp is utilized Again here ATP is utilized but whereas in some other steps ATP is released so energy is released. So somewhere energy is utilized whereas at some places energy is released. So wherever energy is getting utilized that means bonds are getting formed and wherever energy is getting released that means bonds are getting broken. Now since both type of reactions take place in the respiratory pathway that is why respiratory pathway is called an amphibolic pathway. So it is not only about glycolysis even if you take the example of the Krebs cycle there also you will see at certain points energy is released which means that it is a catabolic reaction whereas at some other places the energy is utilized making it an anabolic reaction. So respiratory pathway is indeed an amphibolic pathway because it involves both catabolic as well as anabolic reactions. So with this we have reached towards the end of this lesson and I hope that the explanation on the respiratory processes both aerobic and anaerobic would have helped you. Please try to understand the concepts clearly so that you do not have to memorize the processes. So see you all in the next lesson. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.